Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is Crystal Brando, the Assistant Director of SAMHSA's Program to Achieve Wellness, and we appreciate you logging on today to join our webinar on supporting individuals with serious mental illness in the workplace. Before we get started on this very important topic, a quick disclaimer that the views expressed in this training do not necessarily represent the views, policies, and positions of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So once again, I'd like to thank you all for joining. I'm going to hand it off to our moderator for today's discussion, Caroline Snyder, who is a research analyst at WestDAT, and she'll give a more thorough introduction of herself and our guest speakers today. Caroline? Hi. Uh, thank you, Crystal. As Crystal mentioned, my name is Caroline Snyder, and I work for WestDAT, and I'm joined today by uh, Darcy Grutadaro and Aria Darley with the American Psychiatric Association Foundation. So we look forward to speaking with all of you today a little bit more about um, how you can support individuals with serious mental illness in the workplace. So with this, we're going to go over sort of the import importance of employment recovery, um, talking more about techniques that you can employ to create a more supportive workplace, including related to culture, programs you, you can use, accommodations processes, and then pointing out some relevant resources. So to start, serious mental illness is defined as a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder resulting in serious functional impairment, which substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities. So as in my includes conditions such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and major depression. So the 2016 National Survey on Drug Use and Health found that approximately 1 in 25 adults had a serious mental illness in the previous year. And unfortunately, approximately two-thirds of these individuals with serious mental illness do not currently have full-time employment. So why are employment rates for individuals with serious mental illness so low? Um, many report encountering stigma or discrimination because of their mental health condition from employers, and that in turn discourages them from disclosing their mental illness and getting the support they need to be successful at their job. So at times, their illnesses can create challenges for them to maintain steady employment. Um, sometimes they need to take extra time off to attend behavioral health appointments or perhaps have difficulties concentrating or maintaining focus. But there are many misconceptions about individuals with serious mental illness and their ability to or desire to work. So approximately two-thirds of people with SMI are interested in working, and this number increases further if they felt there was adequate support in the workplace. Uh, also, some studies have found that employment is actually associated with a lower risk of psychiatric hospitalization for individuals with SMI, and this finding persists even after controlling, from an in, uh, controlling for an individual's physical health um, and their history of psychiatric hospitalizations. So some employers or other employees may worry that individuals with SMI are prone to violence. However, in reality, most individuals with SMI are not dangerous, and they're actually more likely to be victims of violence than to commit any violent acts themselves. So why should we try to increase the number of individuals with SMI who are employed? Well, for many people, employment can be a critical step to recovery. And research has indicated that employment is associated with a reduction in mental health system, symptoms um, and their need for services. So one study even found that individuals with schizophrenia uh, who had paid employment were five times more likely to achieve functional remission. So employment is also critical to an individual's holistic wellness. Having a job can improve someone's financial wellness, for example, because it provides them income, and it can allow them to have you know, some degree of financial stability or independence. Also, participating in the workplace can help people build relationships and social connections, and it can provide them with a way to feel more integrated into the community. And then finally, being able to work can be highly valuable to help someone's self-esteem and self-worth. It can give them purpose and meaning, both of which are very important elements to recovery. And I'm going to pass it over to my colleague. that introduction and um, 
really now that we've heard about the importance of employment to recovery, we're going to talk a little bit about how at the Center for Workplace Mental Health, we are really um, helping employers understand how to create a mentally healthy workplace and the importance of doing so so that people with mental illnesses are comfortable in the workplace and really can help them succeed. So we really approach this with four principles in mind for driving change in the workplace. And I'm going to talk about the first two, and then my colleague, Aria Darley, will talk about the second two. So the first really is about knowing the impact. Knowing the impact is important because mental health conditions are common. Uh, one in five Americans lives with a mental illness. And these are conditions that often impact people during their prime working years. So it's really important that employers, especially at a time of very low unemployment and with many positions open, really need to be thinking about how do we support all of our employees, including those that live with a diagnosable and diagnosed mental illness. We also know treatment is effective. So in the overwhelming majority of cases, when people get help and get the care they need, they can get better and perform at their peak in the workplace. Um, we also know that mental illness costs employers in two ways. There's both the direct healthcare costs, so the cost of medication and therapy and treatment, but also there are indirect costs. And this slide actually really identifies some of the indirect costs that employers are increasingly beginning to really pay attention to and, and try to figure out ways to address these so they can make the workplace work much better for people that live with these conditions. So these are things that people may or may not think about, but things like disability and lost productivity, um, absenteeism, not, not coming to work because um, the workplace is not supportive and the condition is, is getting in the way of that. Um, the stress that can exist on team members um, when people are not given the support they need to succeed, the, um, you know, staffing issues, temporary workers. Um, I think retention is a very big issue. Employers don't want to lose good people um, when they know that if someone gets the help and care they need, they can get better, just like any condition, whether it's diabetes or, or um, cancer. I mean, often when people get treatment, they get better and they stay in the workplace, which is very important to employers at a time like this, um, when we're at this low unemployment status. But the good news is that employers are really increasingly tackling how to do a better job in the workplace for their employees when it comes to mental health issues. There were two uh, major surveys done by Willis Towers Watson in 2017 that really showed that over the next three years, uh, large numbers of employers are really focusing on uh, developing more resources to make the workplace um, more accommodating and more supportive for those who are, um, who are living with mental illness in the workplace. So employers are really tackling this by addressing things like educating people more about mental illnesses and raising awareness. And what we have seen employers do is really start by understanding their organization's culture. So this is not a one-size-fits-all, how do we make our organization more, uh, uh, you know, how do we effectively address mental health in the workplace for our organization? They really need to understand their culture. What will work well here? Is it bringing in a speaker? Is it bringing in a turnkey program? Do we need to form a committee and really have the committee decide what's best in terms of addressing mental health in the workplace, it really starts with the culture of the organization and looking at the demographics and looking at, at what will work well. Also, it's very important that employers share their commitment to mental health whenever possible. So anytime they're developing, they're discussing health issues or the importance of health and wellness to, to the organization, they should always add mental health in there. It can't be said enough. Mental health has remained a taboo topic for many, so the more we discuss it in the workplace, the more we can normalize it and bring it out of the shadows and into the light. Also, employers are increasingly looking at opportunities to train leaders, managers, and employees to recognize the early warning signs and feel comfortable to know what to do. How do you start that conversation? How do you show kindness and compassion to a coworker? How do you ask, are you okay, without 
making the other coworker, other person feel uncomfortable. You know, what is it that employers can do to really get that conversation started and normalize the topic of mental health in the workplace? I really think, too, that we are sort of at this turning point in a moment, given the recent high-profile suicides and a recent CDC report that came out showing a rise in suicide. There's a lot more conversation right now about mental health in communities, in faith communities, in the workplace. So this is an ideal time for employers to really take advantage and uh, capitalize on that otherwise um, robust conversation that's happening in communities. So in terms of breaking the silence and tackling stigma and improving workplace mental health, what's really great is when the CEO or someone in the C-suite talks about the importance of mental health. We know mental illnesses impact people at all levels of organizations. We know there are those in the C-suite in this country that are living with mental illness right on down to line staff. It's all along the continuum that people experience these conditions. So it's really important when leadership, who many look to to understand the culture of the organization, when they speak about mental health, it makes it a much more uh, makes it much more likely that those in the organization that may not otherwise want to speak up because they're afraid of negative consequences for their career will come forward and get help and feel more comfortable in the workplace overall. Also, as employers engage in workplace mental health, it's always really helpful to notify the health plan and EAP. Um, EAPs are increasingly looking at innovative approaches to how to encourage people to seek help um, when it comes to uh, emerging or existing mental illness. There's real concerns on the part of employees around confidentiality, around privacy, around coming forward out of concern that doing so may cause negative repercussions in their career. So the more the EAP can be on board and understand this is a priority for the organization and the employer, the better. And again, as I mentioned earlier, training managers on how to effectively respond to behavioral performance issues is very important. Again, kindness and compassion, but certainly managers need to hold employees accountable. This is not about not having accountability in the workplace. This is about asking someone again in a supportive and kind way, are you okay? I've noticed things changing in your performance and mentioning that specifically and then reminding the employee about options that exist should they need help and support in the workplace because after all, a manager's job is to help all of us perform at our, at our best. So the more they can do that, even when it relates to mental health condition or emerging mental illness, the better. I, I want to mention two turnkey programs we have at the Center for Workplace Mental Health that uh, many organizations have found helpful as a starting point because they're easy to pick up and easy to run with. Uh, the first is Right Direction, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, in a moment, and the second is ICU, which my colleague Aria Daly will talk more about um, as well. We developed these programs. I'm going to start with um, Right Direction. We developed these programs in conjunction with um, Employers Health, which is an employee, um, it, it represents uh, large employers in the Midwest of the country, actually in, in a number of places across the country. It is really focused on depression, so it is, it is about raising awareness, um, and it has lots of turnkey resources that employers can use. Uh, we have everything from intranet site postings that organizations can use on their intranet to PowerPoint templates to posters. These are all customizable so that if employers want to put their logo on and want to make some changes to make them work better in their culture, that's something they can certainly do. Um, the materials are, have been used by school districts, by large commercial employers, by smaller employers, um, there's guides and, and really everything that, um, that employers need to succeed. I, I also wanted to mention that we are currently undergoing a research study with Kent State University on Right Direction where we've taken 50 months worth of data and we're actually looking at the impact of the program on things like EAP use, um, accessing mental health care, uh, productivity, performance, retention, and other issues. So we're really, the early results are showing very positive 
um, upward trajectory with EAP use on the part of employees. So we're really excited about that, but we will be publishing it because as we know, employers are really interested in what's effective, what works, what will lead to, um, to the best results. So um, at this point, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Aria Darley, with, with one other thing I wanted to mention, and that is um, we also have on our website, if you're interested in kind of what are other employers doing, we have 70 case studies that really go into detail on different approaches, diverse approaches different organizations have taken to addressing workplace mental health. So I would really encourage you to look at those um, to learn more. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Aria. Thank you so much, Darcy. Uh, Darcy mentioned uh, Right Direction, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about ICU. So the letters ICU can really be interpreted to mean I-S-E-E-Y-O-U, so I see you. And it really encourages employers to create an environment where it's safe for employees to connect with one another, to really care about one another, and also to support one another whenever that is needed. And the core of this campaign is a five-minute video that teaches employees how to I identify the signs. So maybe you've noticed that an employee is not like themselves or maybe um, they're a little withdrawn. And then C, you want to connect with that person. And this is no way mean um, is a way to be intrusive or a way to pry into other people's business, but you truly authentically care and you want to just connect with that person. So you may just ask, are you okay? I noticed that you haven't been yourself lately. And then finally, the last letter, U, just means to understand the way forward together. So ultimately, employers are really equipping employees to recognize the signs of distress and refer each other to resources that really already exist within your organization. So it could be HR, it could be the Employee Assistance Program, it could be mental health and substance use benefits, whatever it is that you're promoting within your workplace. So ICU was developed by DuPont and delivered to over 70,000 of their employees worldwide. It was really given to the center because they saw so much success and they wanted to generously um, donate it to the center to make it available to all employees, I mean employers and employees. And um, with that, we have two versions of uh, ICU on our website currently that we're going to be offering two additional versions in Spanish language and Portuguese very soon. And this is made um, possible through the, uh, another global organization um, that adapted the ICU initiative. So just like Right Direction, this initiative, this initiative fits within the branded structure of any organization, and it has a full implementation guide um, and a PowerPoint deck for those who may be implementing it to present it to the C-suite or to leadership to really make that business case. It also has downloadable and customizable flyers, email templates, and what's really important, pre and post evaluation forms. So you can really determine the effectiveness of the actual initiative. So as we move to creating a supportive workplace, there are four core elements to do that and that we're going to share today. These core components are essential in really helping individuals with serious mental illness maintain employment and to maintain employment in a successful manner for them to be productive and just to be able to stay and keep employment. Um, one of them would be delivering affordable access to mental health care and building a culture of well-being. The others would be having a defined accommodation, accommodations process and then finally developing a plan with the employee. So I'm going to talk in depth about the first two and Caroline will discuss the latter. So delivering um, affordable access to care is more than just saying that, okay, we offer benefits, it's available. It's, it's more about making sure employees know that those benefits are actually available to them and making sure that they know that they can use it and it's accessible, easily accessible. So I want to say just look at your 
organization's data, and then also look at ways to engage your employees so that, again, they know that these benefits are available to them. Employee satisfaction surveys, that's one way that you can do that. See what's working, see what's not working. Engage employees on what's working in terms of access and mental health care. See if they're having difficulties or, you know, if they just stop um, with the process because it's too difficult. Look at your claims data and EAP data, and I'm going to go into a little bit more depth about the EAP data as well. Finally, you want to provide health risk appraisals, but make sure you include mental health questions. And when you do that, you can also connect with your EAP vendor and have them find out ways that they can support you in um, being able to communicate with those who may bring positive for any kind of mental health condition. So delivering affordable access, part of this steps would be um, promoting EAP, as I mentioned earlier, understanding the current use of EAP. And I would say, unfortunately, EAP utilization rates tend to be very low. And this is in spite of the fact that we know it can be very effective, very, a very useful tool if those who it's available to, if they actually use it. So you want to encourage and promote the use of EAP and, and be careful about how utilization rates are defined. Instead of a phone call for information and how you determine utilization rates, you want to make sure that you're measuring utilization in terms of getting those who need certain services, that they're connected to those correct services, not just a phone call. So you want to examine your organization's mental health benefits. Think about it. What, what's covered in these mental health benefits? Is collaborative care being offered? Are the CPT billing codes really being turned on to even a, allow collaborative care to be uh, accessible? How's your network adequacy? Are there enough mental health professionals participating in your health plan? Do employees have access? to navigating, or do they even know how to navigate through the mental health care system that is available? Does your health plan comply with mental health parity? Those are all questions that you want to ask as you think about delivering affordable access to care. And sometimes it's helpful for leaders and HR managers to really go through the process themselves, really understand what it's like. If you were um, a, an employee or a patient going through the system, See, see what it's like to, if, if it's actually easy for you to access the information. And also, it would be helpful for you to know how it goes so that you can explain that to those who are also um, wanting to access the information. So once we do those, we talked about breaking the silence and delivering affordable access to care. and all of those different mechanisms that we want to have in place, now you want to move into building a culture of well-being. When employers foster a culture of well-being, it moves away from relying on traditional biometric screenings or wellness programs, which there's nothing wrong with that, but you want to make sure that you include a holistic approach. And that holistic approach would also include emotional and mental health programs. Areas that have the biggest influence are really those that include these cultural shifts that involve leadership. It involves shared values and effective communication within that environment. It involves showing and creating an environment where employees can really treat one another in a way that they want to be treated. Trust and commitment are really important. They're central to any kind of cultural shift. And if you think about it, just for your own workplace. Imagine what a cultural shift would mean for you. For employers who are implementing effective mental health workplace strategies, the yield is so much greater than just cost savings. Darcy mentioned some of the things about what lies in need, some of those hidden costs. It's really more than that. Companies that support well-being of other employees will find higher engagement. They will find loyalty. 
and that all correlates to productivity and effectiveness and good business results. It also will result in higher productivity and all of those things that will add up in cost savings. And every work environment is different. So I would say look at what is important for your own workplace. What are, value, what are the valuable tools and information that's important to your employees? And really build on those things. So part of building a culture of well-being means that you create an open, an un open understanding and work environment for everyone, including those with serious mental illness. Creating an open and understanding workplace means that you show and you reinforce the values that are important to your, your environment, but then it also means that you're including those employees with serious mental illness and you include those with any kind of mental illness overall, just as much as you do physical health. So we talked about some health programs that can help you achieve this, ICU and Right Direction, but you also want to promote social activities that let colleagues form supportive relationships. Encourage that and be sensitive of situations that would also make people feel uncomfortable. So you don't want to force any kind of situations or any kind of well-being programs on anyone. But make sure you provide manager and employee education, as Darcy mentioned earlier. And there's no such thing as one person bigger than the other to, to be included. Everyone should be included in those trainings and that awareness um, of mental health conditions. Lastly, I want to emphasize that the importance of useful and respective language is so important. You want to be careful of language that really is not respectful of those with mental illness. And you want to encourage others to do the same. Make sure that you be, you're careful about even saying, sometimes people use the language crazy or that's, you know, just that's insane. You want to just be careful about those when you hear that in the workplace and maybe encourage those people who are using that to use language that's outside of those, um, those language words, those words. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Caroline to discuss the accommodations process. Thank you. So, um, as Aria was just talking about, you know, it's having affordable access to mental health care and building that supportive culture are very important, but it's also best practice to have a defined accommodations process. Um, and so just as uh, to note, we are not legal experts. Um, so this is really more about reviewing the general best practices in the field related to accommodations. And if you have any questions about what is or is not required or what's allowed in terms of accommodations or confidentiality related to these issues, we would always recommend that you would consult a legal professional in your state about any federal, state, or local requirements that you might have to abide by. Um, but with that being said, we wanted to speak a little bit more about this because it's very important. Um, and really, the accommodations process should be a collaborative effort. Uh, and the employer and the employee should be working together to really find out how they can best meet the employee need, employee's needs and help them really be successful in the position. So as most of you probably know, um, the American with Disabilities Act is a federal law that prohibits employers from discriminating against individuals with disabilities. So the term disabilities does include psychiatric disabilities, and psychiatric disabilities covers a range of conditions including serious mental illness. So these protections from the ADA would extend to both current employees and potential employees applying for a job. And this law requires employers to provide reasonable accommodations in order to help the employee perform the essential functions of the job. So two key phrases there is reasonable accommodations and essential functions. Um, and these accommodations must be provided unless they would cause undue hardship to the employer. So there are several main steps to the accommodations process, and we wanted to sort of highlight these and discuss them a little bit further. Um, so as I just 
described earlier with the ADA, it refers to these essential functions of the job. So first you need to determine what are considered these essential functions. Um, and to do that, it helps to really sit down and look at the job description and identify the relevant lists of skills or competencies that someone would need in order to be successful. So those are sort of the goals of what you are trying to get the employee to be able to complete. And then next, you need to sort of sit down and talk to the employee and figure out, you know, what are his or her needs or what are the functional limitations sort of in performing those job responsibilities? What are they having challenges with? Um, and then, you know, because it's a collaborative process, it's very imp important that you ask the employee for their input. Um, they should really be part of the brainstorming for strategies and accommodations that may help. They know themselves best, they know their needs best, um, and it, it is more of a give and take back and forth because some things, you know, might cause undue hardship to the employer, they simply don't think that it would work within the parameters of the job, and so you should be flexible, um, but really working together to find a solution that's going to meet all parties' needs. And then once you've put an accommodation in place, you've decided what you're going to try, um, you give it sort of a defined interval, say maybe we'll check back in in a week or two weeks. And after that initial check-in, we'll check in on a monthly basis to see, you know, how is the employee feeling and is this accommodation helping? Do we need to adjust something? Do we need to try something different, um, add another accommodation? Really getting a sense of, you know, what do they need to succeed in the workplace? So what exactly are reasonable accommodations? Um, well, they are modifications or adjustments, uh, and they might be to the job application process. So as I mentioned, the ADA does cover um, potential and prospective employees as well. So perhaps someone needs help with the interview process or the online forms um, to apply. Uh, they could also be modifications or adjustments to the work environment. Um, or to some of the actual ways in which the job is performed or perhaps uh, supervised. So the main goal of these accommodations is to ensure that employees with disabilities can enjoy the equal be benefits and privileges of employment. So there are a number of accommodations that can be put in place. and. If you're, you know, struggling to come up with what would work best for the employee, there are a number of resources out there that have specific examples. We'll talk about a little, a few of them now, but um, we'll list those resources at the end of the presentation. And please do go and visit those websites and those organizations because they they have a lot of examples about things that you could try if you don't know where to start. Um, perhaps they give you an idea for something that you could adapt for your own workplace, and that can be very helpful um, because sometimes. Sometimes, you know, someone might be struggling and they don't know exactly what they need. So it might be a little bit of a give and take back and forth until you figure out what really works. But so these uh, are some of the types of accommodations that you could possibly put in place, sort of categorized by topic area. Um, so for example, in terms of scheduling, um, you know, working remotely has become a lot more common, um, whether it's planned remote work on a certain day of the week or you know, giving more flexibility to unplanned uh, remote work if someone's having a difficult day that they are having a hard time getting into the office. Um, you could also allow them to have a more flexible schedule to accommodate mental health appointments, sort of shifting their schedule based on those needs and having them work, um, you know, hours on a different day to make up and not um, interfere or, or sort of use all of their sick leave, things like that. Uh, sometimes there can be issues with the work environment itself. Um, so maybe they're struggling to concentrate and you could move them to a different part of the office that perhaps, perhaps less, you know, has less foot traffic or you could provide them with um, noise canceling headphones to kind of drown out some of that background noise. Um, for example, if someone has uh, serious depression, maybe they need to be somewhere with uh, different lighting or more natural light, um, something that kind of helps with their, their mood um, and will in turn help with their work performance. Uh, sometimes serious mental illness and other mental health conditions can help uh, sort of challenge concentration or memory. 
So you could work with them to figure out strategies to really help them know what they need to do and um, make sure that they have all the tools available to them to do that. So for example, you could provide written instructions for job tasks or you could allow them to use a recording device during meetings so that you know they are able to leave that meeting and sort of have a recording of the things they've been asked to do and they can go back and refer to that. Um, feedback and supervision is another area uh, which can possibly be overlooked, but can have a really big impact on how someone feels at work. So uh, different styles and techniques can really make a difference in someone's work performance, and so maybe you can ask for their preferences on communication methods. Do they prefer receiving feedback in person, on, you know, or do they not necessarily like having that direct contact and would actually like written feedback in an email? Um, maybe you have to schedule regular check-ins to discuss their performance so they feel supported and like someone knows how they're doing and that they have the opportunity to improve. Um, for challenges related to organization, you could create detailed timelines for job tasks uh, or you could create structured to-do lists and help them prioritize those tasks so they know how they should be dividing their time um, and make sure they're meeting all the expectations. Um, and then finally, in terms of stress and emotions, so work may unintentionally create some emotionally stressful situations, and honestly that can be true um, regardless of whether you have serious mental illness or not, but in this case, you know, perhaps you could make a plan to use stress management or conflict resolution techniques should any situation arise. Um, you really have to go with all of these accommodations, as I said before, something that really gets at what the employee's needs are and what they need to feel as though you as the employer are being more supportive. So next we wanted to speak a little bit about um, privacy and confidentiality. Um, and the truth is is that, you know, this is a uh, uh, can be a very sensitive issue, obviously, and so one of the key tenets to the accommodations process is the need to maintain privacy and maintain that employee confidentiality. So um, this is, you know, a more complex issue than can just be captured in one slide, but at sort of the very high level, it really means that any private health information that is collected or any communications about the accommodations process or about uh, the individual's mental health condition really need to be kept secure. So one of the ways that you could do this, for example, is also to make sure that any of the document documentation um, is kept separate from the main personnel file. So that helps you know, add an extra barrier so that access to this information is limited and that it's really only available to someone on a need-to-know basis. But it also is important to note um, that, you know, when accommodations are visible, you might have questions from people, other people in the office and things like that, asking, well, why did they, why did suddenly they have headphones? Why do they have a different schedule? Um, and, you know, we would recommend, um, as I said, always consult with a legal professional or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the Office of Disability Employment, um, you know, for specifically how to handle those situations. But the main um, principle is always maintain the privacy and confidentiality of that employee and find a way to communicate any changes about the workplace environment in such a way that does not disclose their disability. So the next thing, um, which is kind of an adjunct to the accommodations process, um, but something that we thought would be good to spend a little bit of time on, um, is this idea of developing a written plan. So uh, the accommodations process should really be similar regardless of whether someone has a serious mental illness or any other mental health condition. But in the case of someone with a serious mental illness, it might be helpful to also develop a written plan um, describing how the employer can best support this person. So this plan can include the employee's goals because ultimately the goal is for um, the accommodations and everything to help the employee succeed. So you want to know what are those goals, what are we trying to accomplish. Um, it should detail the planned accommodations and sort of what your plan is for you know, assessing their impact and seeing whether or not they're working. It's also possibly helpful to identify potential stressors in the employee's life. Um, you know, are they stressed about um, 
family, finances, obviously any conversations with that you should be sensitive and only um, ask for things that the employee is willing to disclose. But if that's something that they would like to be noted, um, it can be helpful to understand what's going on in their life that might impact their work performance. And then it's also helpful to potentially detail a plan response if the employee appears to be unwell. What are their preferences? You know, make a plan now while the employee is doing well so that if anything seems to change, um, you know how to handle it and also the employee knows what to expect and that they're able to kind of give their feedback and communicate their preferences. Similarly, um, as I spoke before, feedback can sometimes be a difficult um, and sensitive issue. So it's important to be respectful of the employee preferences related to management and supervision. And that can be something that is also very helpful to detail in the plan. And then finally, uh, you want to detail when you hold scheduled check-ins to make sure that everything is working smoothly and whether you need to make any adjustments. So this is uh, just a few resources um, that are available for employers, and there are obviously many, many more out there. Um, first, as noted by both Darcy and Aria, the American Psychiatric Association Foundation and the Center for Workplace Mental Health have wonderful resources available that you can refer to. Um, the two programs that they mentioned, Right Direction and ICU, um, are those turnkey programs that can be adapted and implemented in a variety of businesses. The Working Well, Leading a Mentally Healthy Business is a toolkit that also provides recommendations and concrete strategies to improving uh, mental health in the workplace. And then some of the other um, resources listed here, the Job Accommodation Network has a wealth of information, um, resources, tools, toolkits related to um, the accommodations process. It provides more detail about what you should and should not do. Um, NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, again, has a lot of information about the importance of employment to recovery and how employers can be supportive. And then finally, the Office of Disability Employment po Policy, uh, which is within the U.S. Department of Labor, has some of those technical requirements um, related to the ADA and other relevant laws, and it also does a great job of linking to other organizations that have resources that might be of help. Great, thank Hi, you so much. Oh, sorry, I was just going to yeah. say, go ahead. I know Darcy had something to add. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much. I did want to mention something that I, I forgot to mention during uh, the presentation earlier, and that is the role of caregivers. Um, employers are increasingly recognizing that employees who have a loved one with, especially with serious mental illness, because some of the um, needs can be significant, particularly early on. So employers are increasingly recognizing the need to support uh, their employees that may be serving in a caregiver role. Uh, we actually did, we, we recently published a blog on our website about a, a mom whose son developed schizophrenia when she was a, a software developer at IBM, a highly valued employee, extremely productive. And um, when schizophrenia kind of hit their family, she needed to take a, a considerable amount of time to help him um, find a treatment facility. As she said, she could sometimes take, she sometimes had to take time during the workday to contact different facilities because that was the only time the business office was open at those um, treatment centers. I shouldn't say facilities, treatment centers and hospitals. And so uh, the challenges can be quite significant, not just for um, caregivers of adults living with serious mental illness, but also parents of children. Uh, who may be experiencing the early signs and onset of a mental illness, who are often called away from school, called away from work to go to school to pick up their child. Um, their child may have appointments during the day that they need to attend to. So um, employers are really focusing much more on caregivers, recognizing the role they must play for their loved ones when they have a serious mental illness. And um, the National Alliance for Caregiving, NAMI, and Mental Health America put out a report in 2016 called On Pins and Needles, Caregivers of Adults with Mental Illness, 
that I think is a really nice um, explanation of the experience of those that care for a loved one with SMI. Um, but again, the, this does not only apply to adults, it applies quite, um, quite a bit as well to children and youth. So um, employers are really beginning to uh, find ways to um, help employees feel comfortable talking about this in the workplace when they need to take time away or supporting them through the day and giving them extra time to help secure care for their loved one. So I think we're going to see more and more of this happening because employers that don't want to lose good employees and they recognize that if they don't support them through the process of supporting their loved one, they're really at risk of losing very good people. So the one thing I would say about the blog we posted, and most of our blogs go out to, we have about 10,000 on our list for any employers. This is one of our highest hit rates. So that was a sign to us in terms of click-through rates. That was a sign to us that employers really value the information about what to do. And we have some recommendations in the blog that the mom who wrote it came up with that were excellent policy recommendations and otherwise on what employers can do to really support caregivers of those with um, serious mental illness. So I did want to mention that. I didn't want to forget it. It's extremely important. Great. Thank you so much for adding that. Um, and a huge thank you to all three of you, Caroline, Aria, and Darcy, for sharing this information. Um, Caroline started this webinar off saying how one in 25 adults or 4% of adults have a serious mental illness. Um, and it's important to remember that um, even on top of that, one in five has any mental illness according to the National Institutes of Health. So for an employer, um, there's a chance that one in five individuals in that workplace are dealing with a um, mental health challenge. And so having this information is very important. Um, what we're going to do now is hop into the Q&A session of today's webinar. Um, we have quite a few comments that have come in about how helpful this information is. So again, uh, Caroline, Darcy, and Aria, we can't thank you enough. Um, and we have a couple of questions that we'll put out to you as well. And I just wanted to let you know, as we get into the Q&A, you'll be seeing um, a file share document on your screen with an occupational wellness uh, MP3. So what you see on your screen now is a podcast created by SAMHSA's Program to Achieve Wellness that goes into a little bit more detail on some of the topics that we've talked about today in a bit of a storytelling fashion. So it gives some examples of what occupational wellness, excuse me, what accommodations could look like in a workplace. What would that actually mean for an employee going through their day at work? Um, so again, it's a bit of a storytelling narrative and a podcast that we've developed, and we hope you find it to be a great complement to this uh, discussion. So we'll have that file share on the screen. You could go ahead and download that while we get into the Q&A. Um, so the first question we have, uh, you already spoke to this a little bit, um, Aria and Darcy, but there's a question about ICU and right direction and whether or not they're free. That's part one of the question. And part two, would an employer use just one of them or both of them? Would they go together? Can you talk a little bit more about any relationship between the two of them? So, the, yes, the ICU and Right Direction programs are both free. They're turnkey and they're available on our website, workplacementalhealth.org. And um, in terms of, so Right Direction is a depression initiative. So it's encouraging those with um, depression or those who may be ha experiencing some kind of um, some signs of uh, depression for them to actually seek help. And it also um, allows employers to, to get that information and make sure that employees have that. As far as ICU, it's more of an emotional response program, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and again, going to that cultural shift, um, encouraging employers to just talk about mental health um, and mental health conditions and making sure that people know that it's okay to ask if it's okay, and then people know that there's help, there's EAP, um, their resources available, and both of them together um, encourages um, employees to to utilize EAP um, if, if it's available in your workplace and um, help those who may be experiencing some kind of um, emotional distress or may be experiencing some kind of issues and they feel like something is just not right. It just encourages them to seek the help that they need. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and a question that anyone, um, any one of the three of you could answer, 
if an employer believes they don't have anyone with serious mental illness on their staff, if there wasn't anyone that disclosed about having um, a serious mental illness that would require accommodations, do you think accommodations would still be valuable for the entire workforce? So anyone who wants to answer that one. This is Caroline. Well, um, Sorry, Caroline, do you want to start and then we'll go to Maria? Sure. I'll just quickly, um, you know, in general, I think it's best practice for employee, employers to constantly be sort of understanding of their employees' needs and finding out ways that they're, um, they can best meet them. And that can be in a variety of ways, whether or not it technically qualifies as a, a psychiatric disability. I think that in general, promoting a mentally healthy workplace and finding strategies and ways to work with employees to sort of support their own mental health, whether or not they have a serious mental health condition, is in general something that there is a lot of value in. I think sometimes when you talk about the accommodations, reasonable accommodations, it might be in the context of what's legally required, but I think that, you know, if an employer is rightfully interested and values the mental health of their employees, that that's something that they should always be taking into consideration and always be looking ways um, to support anyone. And also, reasonable accommodations do extend beyond just serious mental illness, but any te technically it's considered a psychiatric disability um, that interferes with, um, you know, performing any of the functions uh, of having a normal day-to-day -day life. So it can be um, anxiety and, and things like that. And so in general, whatever an employer can do and is willing to do to help their employees will ultimately be beneficial to them um, and to the produ productivity and happiness of their workforce. Yeah, this is Darcy. I just want to really piggyback on that excellent response. I think that is absolutely the, the way to look at this, that, that whole like the legal requirements under the ADA and accommodations that really help people succeed versus the overall culture and well-being of the workforce. So what we're seeing is there seems to be a bigger focus on stress and work-life balance and how those issues can really play out in people developing mental health conditions like depression and anxiety and there's a lot of concern in, in looking at things like loneliness and isolation and how those factors play into people perhaps developing or showing early signs of, of mental, uh, mental illness. And employers are paying attention to the fact that when you create that mentally healthy workplace, as Caroline described it, where you have reasonable hours, people act, take their vacation, people are talking about work-life balance and really modeling it at the highest levels of the organization, employers start to see the results in their healthcare claims and healthcare costs. And the, the one thing we know from the research is that when an individual, many individuals that have chronic health issues, things like cardiovascular disease, major back issues, have a lot of serious health conditions, often mental health will co-travel with it. And when that is the case, the overall health care costs for the employer are two to three times higher. So really employers are looking at how do we create that healthy balance so that we can keep people's overall health and mental health that's connected to it um, at its best. Excellent. Thank you both for uh, your responses to that question. Um, another question here that's tailored a little bit more for Rhea and Darcy. Um, you mentioned that there are case studies on your website of different employers. So there's a question of if there are organizations of all sizes that you showcase so people know if the examples would be applicable, excuse me, applicable to them, um, something that they could do in their own workplace. Yeah, great question. We have currently about 70 case studies. They are searchable, so you can search them with, uh, by size, by industry, and we do have uh, case studies from organizations of all sizes, everything from Prudential American Express to much, much smaller companies to uh, public. Uh, we have municipalities. We have um, manufacturing, we have white collar service industries, a lot of diversity and really impressive array of ways in which organizations are approaching it. 
We're about to post one, two actually, with ac large academic centers. One is the University of Michigan. The other is Kent State University that I mentioned earlier. So we have academic centers at the higher education level. A lot of diversity. And there, by the way, when we look at our metrics, the case studies are one of the most frequently visited places on our website. Excellent. Thank you for that detail. Um, we're going to take one last question in the interest of time, and this is open to all three of you, whoever would like to answer. And the question is about um, the different reasonable accommodations that Caroline went through. Do you know of any training programs for supervisors uh, to learn how to implement these things? So if an organization wanted to try flexible scheduling, can they learn kind of how to do that in best practices? Are you aware of any trainings or additional resources on those topics? So I'll start, this is Darcy. Um, that is a great question, and actually we get asked it a lot. And Aria and I just looked at each other and said, we're getting that question again. Um, it is, there's a great need for this, and I'm not aware of any. I wonder if the EEOC um, may have some suggestions. We'll look into this. Crystal, and if we can find something that you could post perhaps with this, um, by, by contacting the EOC, we'll share that with you, but we are not aware of any, but it is a great question and there's a great need. Yeah, we'll have the email addresses for all of the attendees um, and we can send that, if you're able to come up with anything, we could send it to folks uh, via email afterwards. That would be great. And I just wanted to add, um, I don't know of a specific sort of static training, but um, I would definitely recommend checking the Job Accommodation Network because they do do trainings, they do um, webinars and things like that. Um, so they might have something in their training library, although I haven't um, delved as deep as I would have liked to into it recently, um, that might fit that bill um, and sort of cover those topics specifically. Excellent, great recommendation, Caroline, thank you. Um, so, like I said, in the interest of time, that was our last question. We're going to wrap up. Um, as a reminder, the session is being recorded, and the recording will be available on SAMHSA's YouTube channel. And in the meantime, everyone joining today's webinar will get a copy of the slide deck emailed to you, as well as a certificate of participation. And we'll try to also um, email this podcast that's on the screen. So, once again, you have the file transfer box up on the uh, window, and it's a podcast on occupational wellness and talks about um, reasonable accommodations and how to support individuals with uh, serious mental illness in the workplace. So that's a podcast developed by SAMHSA's program to achieve wellness. Um, I'm on it, so if you download it, you'll hear my voice again. And it also features uh, Jasmine Brando, the co-founder of Humankind Workshop. So different speakers from today's presentation, but a similar topic that we hope you'll find uh, valuable and a great supplement to what you heard today. So with that, I would like to say thank you once again to Caroline, Aria, and Darcy for this very meaningful uh, conversation. And we thank everyone for joining us and hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you.